Hi, I'm Rich. Welcome to my workshop. I want to talk to you today about the Solinary and Project Designer. Now, I learned long ago that it's always better to draw up a plan before I make something. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember as a young teenager reading a book about the Wright brothers, you know, the guys that made the first successful airplane. And one of the things that they made long before they made the air, their first airplane was a sled. And their mother drew out the sled with them on a piece of paper. And she said something really important to them. She said, if it looks bright on paper, it'll look right when you build it. There's a lot of truth to that statement. Drawing something out before you build it gives you the opportunity to think through the process, think th through how everything's going to fit together, and make adjustments to your design. Now, a lot of people today do that on computer, do it with 3D CAD, such as SketchUp, and that's great if you can do it. Um, a lot of professional woodworkers do things like that. I've just never taken the time to learn how, and if you can't do it well, there's no sense doing it on the computer. I've always, for the 50 years I've been doing woodworking, I've always sketched things out by hand. And now I've come across Solinary's project designer which makes it easy to sketch things out by hand and get a good accurate drawing that's going to give you the material list, your cut list, everything you need so that you can build your project. So let's take a look at what's in this project designer. I've gone ahead and printed out the Solinary project designer and put in a three ring notebook. Just makes it an easy way to keep everything. Uh, maybe you don't use three ring notebooks. I use them for a lot of stuff. Okay. So here's a project that I'm working on and I'm going to step you through what I've done to create this in the project designer. First of all, the very first thing you do is create a 3D image. Now, creating 3D on computers is a big deal, okay? And there's a lot of good software out there for doing it. But for most people, creating 3D by hand is a, a tedious project. This makes it easy. This is what's known as an isometric view, which is 3D, okay? And they've got a, a special grid here that's already laid out the lines in the 3D, and you can use that to design your project. You know, in a matter of minutes, you can lay this out, see how things are going to look, and get an overall view of your project. And that's exactly what I've done here. Uh, this is done in pencil. Uh, I'll just warn you right now, if you sit down to design a project and you're anything like me, you're going to make changes. You're going to find, oh, that doesn't work the way I intended. i got to adjust it. Figure it's going to be part of the process, okay? One key thing I learned in doing this is that this point right here, this nexus, which we got this line and this line and the center line coming together, start from there. I started from all the way down here, and I realized... I I had to move it up and so that that's your starting point okay that's that front top corner of whatever it is other versions of the same template for making things that are tall and wide this is kind of boxy so i started off with this and here i've got my basic view now this isn't exactly right in the sense of the measurements being right. It's not done to measurements, it's approximate. The idea being here so I can see how everything fits together, see what pieces that I need, okay? Once I've got that done, then I went to the next page, and this is a, a, a special graph paper that's scaled 1 to 12, and they provide you with scales that are matching that. You can't go out and buy a 1 to 12 scale. I've looked. I've got engineering scales from my engineering days, and I've looked at them, and I looked online. I could not find a 1 to 12 scale, okay? So they've provided you with a 1 to 12 scale. I want ahead and coated this using uh, just clear packing tape to make it last longer uh, but I didn't actually use it to draw my lines I used a different ruler for that and I've got this as a, a reference for measuring okay so here I've got I started off with a cutaway view and that's the, not the normally way you do it usually you start off with either your front view or this is the top view and really the top view should be up here but it didn't fit properly so I ended up putting it over here and as you can see I had to cut the corner off of it but that's all right I still get the idea of what I'm doing so my front view I've got essentially a bunch of boards that are vertical and I'm trying to go for a like a farm door sort of a look and, and the reason I'm doing that is the room this is going to go in has a has a farm door type door in there okay and so I did the cutaway because I wanted to see how everything was going to fit together and this is basically my sideboards my top and bottom rails and then here I've put in a rail on the inside for the lid to set down into now rather than upholstering the top of this I'm designing it so it'll, one of the pillows off of the sofa one of the throw pillows will fit in it and so this lip is so that that pillow will sit in just right and this rail which is going to run around the inside of it it's, it's shown here as well uh, gives that lid something to sit on I had thought about making a hinge lid and I said you know it's not gonna be open that often why do I need a hinge lid so the lid's just gonna sit on top of that and then I put the bottom in and instead of just coming up to it I've gone ahead and, and designed it so I'm rabbiting in to the ends of the, the edges of the sides to set that in so I, I end up with a gap there and then my little legs down the bottom the legs are there mostly so it'll match the, the 
sofa that's in the room, okay? So this, this allows me to get everything right. Everything is dimensionally or proportionally correct at that one to 12 scale. And I've written in my dimensions. I don't know if you can see in there. Uh, I did the, Since I did this in pencil, it might be a little hard to see. But I've got all my dimensions and I know exactly what uh, everything is going to be. Now from there, I can take that and I can create my cut list, or this is actually a cut diagram. So these are all one by four boards and, and I'm using eight foot boards. So I've put an arrow here marking off where 96 inches is. I can't go past that. And this is the boards. These pieces are the boards that are, are on the, the sides. And then this, this one, these are the boards that are going around the top and the bottom, the bottom and top rails. And so I've got all my pieces here showing, and that tells me how many actual pieces of wood I have to buy in order to have everything I need to make this. And also shows me how I'm going to cut it. So I don't have to worry about when I get the material here that, oops, I didn't buy enough because I ended up cutting it differently. I already decided how I'm going to cut it to make sure I get everything out of it. And if you can see here, I've only got about five inches of scrap on this these four boards. And on these two boards, I've only got about an inch of scrap. So I'm, I'm not wasting a whole lot of material. And then I also have two pieces cut out of plywood. Now, I'm not going to buy a, a eight foot sheet of plywood. I'm going to buy a two foot by four foot piece of plywood. And I can see that I can fit that well, the two pieces I need on that. And I'm not going to be wasting a whole lot of material. And then from there, I've created my material list. So I know looking at these pieces here, I need a total of two plus four, six, uh, one by fours, eight feet long. And then I need a two by two. That's what the feet are going to be made from. Actually, I already have that. That's what it says on hand here. So I have to go buy that. And then I need that piece of plywood that's going to be used for the top and the bottom. Uh, as far as hardware, I need finished nails. That's going to be in an air nail. I'm going to assemble it with my air nailer. Uh, so I really don't have to buy those because I have them. And I'll need some stain for finishing it. And then here I've put together my basic process. So thinking through, it's a good idea to think through the steps you're going to go through to make the project and just get them in order. And that's what I've done here. There's not a lot of detail there, but it tells me what I need to do and when I need to do it. So I am doing something out of order. And yes, I have done things out of order. I have to confess to you, I cheated just as I was cutting up with my material. After I had done my plan and come up with my cut list, I came to the realization I didn't have enough bar clamps to glue everything together. So what I've done is for the four sides, I've cut them in pairs of two. So my pieces are twice as long, actually a little more than that. So I have some room for cutting and evening up the edges. So when it looks like I'm, I'm gluing pieces together too long, that's why, okay? Now to cut or to glue them together, I need a bunch of bar clamps. and. Uh, let me just say about something about clamps. You never have enough. Uh, I know guys, every time they go to the lumber yard, they buy another clamp just to add to their collection. You never have enough, okay? I don't have enough. And uh, for gluing something like this, you need cauls as well. Now, a cawl is any piece of wood that's used to help you with clamping. If you're trying to clamp to a curved surface, that clamp's going to move. So you might need a, a, a piece of wood that you've taken a wood block and cut the curve in it, and the other side's flat. So the curve can go up against whatever it is you're gluing in a flat, the clamp can go up against that, okay? For edges gluing boards together we use just plain flat calls these are two by twos poplar two by twos and they're coated with beeswax now you don't have to use beeswax you can use any sort of wax but the idea behind the wax is that it keeps the glue from sticking and you can see how quickly i applied that wax that's good enough the whole idea is that the glue doesn't stick to these if it oozes out and and it probably will ooze out and actually you probably want it to ooze out uh, if you do, if your glue doesn't ooze out there's a good chance you don't have enough so i'm gonna lay out my pieces here and i'm look just looking to see that that they meet up pretty well now typically when you're edge gluing panels like this or boards to make a panel you will um, joint the edges okay with a plane or uh, with a jointer if you have a jointer available to you and the reason for that is that it makes sure your edges are absolutely straight and the other thing you'll do is probably plane the wood to make sure it's all a consistent thickness i'm not doing it that in this case and my reason for not doing it is i'm going for a rustic look and so if it's a little bit off that's in this situation that's evident okay that's not the norm so now i'm going to apply the glue there are a lot of ways you can apply glue uh you can buy fancy glue applicator bottles with rollers or or foam on them or brushes some guys will squeeze out the glue and then brush it out uh, if you have a large area that's really great I prefer to go on the old-fashioned way and i just put the glue on here and spread it with my finger uh, i've had my fingers a lot more than i've had any rollers so it just seems or brushes and it seems to work out pretty well now when you're putting your glue on here you want to make sure you get enough you're better off with too much rather than and not enough. Uh, I, well, if you have enough glue, you're actually going to have a touch too much because it's going to ooze out a little bit when we apply the clamping pressure.
Okay, now that I've got the glue spread, it's time to clamp my boards together. I'm going to go ahead and set my calls, the other half of my calls on in place here. I'm not going to clamp them yet. Um, my calls are in pairs and they're labeled that way, so I make sure I use them the right ones together all the time. And uh, I'm using five clamps. I would really rather be using more, but you work with what you got. A potential problem anytime you're edge gluing like this and that is that the the whole piece can bow and that's from the pressure of the clamps and maybe any unevenness in the edges and that's what the calls are there for so i'm going to clamp the calls together this is our glued up panel here and as you can see there's some glue that's squeezed out that's that excess glue i was talking about that we actually want to have be there but we can't leave it there so we're going to take a chisel and we're going to clean up this glue getting rid of the excess now there's some people that'll tell you that rather than using a chisel and dealing with this glue when it's dry you should take a wet rag and clean it off beforehand what that's going to do is get that glue down into the pores of the wood and it won't accept stain and won't and it'll be a, a, a spot there when you try and varnish it so you don't want to do that there are a couple different ways we can assemble the side and back of our ottoman together or any box for that matter so if this is one of our sides which actually it is and we're going to pretend this is the bottom one way we can do it is butt it up here and then go ahead and nail it through that works but we might end up with some gaps especially if our panels aren't uh, glued absolutely perfect second way is to put it on top and then glue up and nail up through the bottom uh that leaves the edges of the plywood exposed, which really isn't a problem because we got a piece of trim that's going to cover it up. So that's a second possibility. The third possibility is to take the panel and use a router to cut a rabbit in the edge of it and allow it to overlap. And I've actually cut the rabbit a little too deep so that the panel can set up a little bit. This is a, a much neater configuration. We won't end up with any gaps. We won't end up with anything showing, even if our, pa if our panels don't match up perfectly. So that's what I've chosen to do. Assembling the box itself is fairly easily. I'm using corner clamps to make sure I get a 90 degree corner. I've only got two corner clamps. I don't have four like we need to go all the way around. That's not a problem because what I'm going to do is I make two sub assemblies and then I'll put the two sub assemblies together. So what I'm doing with a corner clamp is setting my pieces in place and I'm making sure I have an overlap. Now the overlap in this design is important. Rather than going with mitered corners, I'm going with square corners and I'm going to overlap one piece over the other. The tricky thing is I've got to make sure I keep maintaining that same overlap all the way around. So if I'm going here like hidden piece, the piece that's closer to me overlapping the other piece, then I need to continue going that way all the way around. Otherwise my box is going to end up out of square. Once I dry fit the pieces together, I take them apart, squeeze some glue in there, and then uh, smooth the glue out with my finger. Put the piece back in, clamp it, make sure it's aligned well, and then I'm going to nail it with an air nailer. Now, if you don't have an air nailer, it's not a problem. You can do the exact same thing with screws. I'm using the air nailer because I have it. It's easy. It's quick. And uh, actually, it's a good investment. With both sub-assemblies made, I can now use my two corner clamps to connect them together. So I'm just going to use the corner clamps on the two sides that need to be connected together. Now again, I've got to maintain that overlap. That's the most important thing I've got to do here. Make sure that I keep my overlap direction going the same. If not, I'm going to end up with a box that's out of square. So first I dry fit the various pieces together to make sure everything's going to fit together properly and I've got my clamp set properly. Then I'll take it back apart, put glue on the joints, set the pieces together and go ahead and nail them together with the air nailer once again. According to the plans I came up with for this ottoman, the legs are tapered. And I did that mostly so that they would uh, go well with the sofa that this is going to. And so I've cut some little blocks of just two by two pine here, three inches long. Obviously they're not tapered, so I need to taper them. And I'm going to do that on the table saw. I've set my blade angle to about 12 degrees. Uh, that wasn't an exact, that was more like that's about what I want. But the big thing is I came up with this little jig here. Now, when the table saw can be extremely dangerous. Uh, the one injury I've had with a power tool was to my
my thumb. I actually split the bone there on a table saw, and that was years and years ago. Um, you really got to watch out for that blade. And you notice I don't have a blade guard here like I should, and that's mostly because I can't see the piece or get the piece in there with the blade guard. So what I had to do is come up with something that would hold my block of wood because trying to hold this with your finger in place, uh, that's really risky, okay? And it's it's likely to, to wobble a little bit and not going to get a clean cut anyway. So all this is is three pieces of wood put together to make like a corner of a box. And then I've added a, a little bridge to go over the top of my fence, which will just keep it from coming out this way. This allows me to clamp the block that I'm going to be cutting to the front edge so that it's right here at the blade and my hands all the way back here out of the way. Now, the only thing that could be risky here is the clamp getting in the blade. So I want to make sure that my clamp's really tight so it doesn't loosen up as I start my cut. So now you can see the first cut here. I've tapered this side. So now I want to taper one more side to, to match it. We'll go ahead and loosen the clamp up, set this back in place, and I'm going to cut this side. It really doesn't matter which side, just as so long as I have two adjacent sides. And the reason I'm only worried about two sides is because the other two sides are going to be towards the inside where they won't even be visible. So if, as long as I, as I manage to taper two sides effectively, I'm going to end up with a, a good tapered leg for this piece of furniture. Again, I want to make sure I get the clamp good and tight. Okay, and we'll go ahead and cut that one. So here's my bottom. I went ahead and cut it to, to dimension. And as you can see, it fits just like it's supposed to. But before I glue and nail this in place, I want to go ahead and attach the legs because it'll be a whole lot easier. So we're just going to set this aside. And uh, this will be the bottom side. And I want to put my legs inset, say an inch and a half from the edge. Now I want them square and I want them dimension right and I've got to attach them from the other side. So the best way to make sure that this comes out right is take a couple little blocks of wood and attach them here and that gives me like a little pocket that I can set into, okay? So we'll apply a little glue. Now some people tell you you can't glue end grain of wood um, because it doesn't hold. Well in testing it does. The only thing I'd say is put a little more glue than you normally would, okay? I'm not bothering to spread it around with my fingers simply because I've put enough glue there then I'm sure it's going to spread around. And now with the blocks holding it lined up exactly where I want and I put it 180 degrees out because I've got my bevel to the inside instead of the other side. Remember what I said about measure twice cut once? Well that goes for screwing and nailing and everything else too. So now with it in place I can nail it and what the nails are doing more than anything else is holding it together while the glue dries. Now that my legs are attached to my bottom, I'm ready to put my bottom into the cube. And I'm going to double check, make sure it fits, make sure it's square. We're all good. Now we can put a little glue in there and nail that in place. Both the trim and the support for the lid are going to be made out of one by fours, just like everything else. I decided to do that just to make my material acquisition easier. The trim gets nailed onto the box as we've created it at both the top and the bottom mimicking that barn door style that we've been going for all along. Now I'm overlapping the end of the top trim piece over the, the overlap from the, the sides just like I did before. The whole idea here is to just add a little more strength. Notice I'm not gluing it, I'm just nailing it. These are not structural elements, they're just decorative. I really couldn't show the installation of this piece here on, on camera just because it you know, it's on the inside and getting the camera at the right angle. But what I've got here is just a piece of three quarter inch square that I've uh, pine that I've put in there to give me something for the lid to sit on. You know, it's down a little bit and that's taking into account the thickness of the pillow that's going to act as a cushion. But with that there, I can just drop my lid in. Now the lid is just a piece of plywood, half inch plywood. I rounded the corners and edges, put a finger hole in there and round the edges of that too. This is all nice and smooth so there's nothing to get a splinter off of. And this just drops in. Now it's a whole lot easier than having to put a hinge in and a latch and all that. And then the cushion sits right on top of there. And there's a nice comfy place for my feet when I'm sitting there on the sofa, talking to my wife, watching TV, whatever it might be. It's actually ended up being a pretty simple project to do. And the reason it was 
simple is because I started off with a good design. And it, this project planner that Solinaries put out just makes it so much easier, especially this first page here. We've got that isometric view, the 3D view. Being able to start out with that and, and have a good idea what the project's going to look like when it's done really helps. And lo and behold, you know, the project looks pretty much like the drawing. After going through all the steps in this, figuring out the materials, I only had one trip to the lumberyard, and that's amazing in and of itself. I didn't end up short anything, and uh, the project went together really easy. So taking the time to develop a plan, to do your drawings, is really worth it because it's going to cut down on errors, speed up your woodworking time, and give you a better project when you're done with it. So the way I do things, the way I've always done things, I just didn't have this to work with. Having this makes it easy. I highly recommend that you try it for your own project. So why not go build something, and uh, we'll see you next time.